Ne'ilah, the closing of the gates. In this Yom Kippur text study, we will learn about Ne'ilah, the concluding service of Yom Kippur. What does it mean that the gates are closing at the end of this day? What are we meant to do in these final moments? How might we feel when the service comes to a close? We'll take a look at some of the prayers and meditations in the service and do some reflecting in anticipation of the closing moments of Yom Kippur. So some opening questions to consider are, what are your associations with the end of Yom Kippur? If you have been to an Ne'ilah service before, what has it felt like? And where do you hope to be spiritually and emotionally at the end of Yom Kippur this year? So I'm going to guide us through a text study sheet. If you have it in front of you, that's great. Um, you can follow along with the page numbers noted at the bottom right hand side of the page and the source numbers, which are on the left before each source. And if you don't have a source sheet, that's okay. I will read everything out loud. So let's begin with an introduction to Ne'ila. What is it and what is included? So we're on page one of the source sheet. And we're going to look at source number one. Ne'ilah means closing and referred originally to the closing of the gates of the ancient temple in Jerusalem. It then took on a more spiritual meaning and was understood to refer to the symbolic closing of the gates of heaven. On ordinary weekdays, there are three services at which we recite the Amidah, Arvit, evening, Shachrit, morning, and Mincha, afternoon. On Shabbat and festivals, we add a fourth, musaf, literally addition. And that comes from the verb lehosif, to add. In the Talmud, a fifth service, called Ne'ilah, was added on all fast days. Today, though, we recite a Ne'ilah service on Yom Kippur only. So this is a once-a-year service. I want to bring us into two pieces of liturgy um, included in the Ne'ilah service. The first is a piyut, a poem, and the second um, are a series of lines that come at the very end of the service. So we're going to look at source number two on page one. Attributed to Moshe ibn Ezra, often referred to just as ibn Ezra, this piyut introduces Ne'ilah in the Sephardic rite. Note that the name Moshe and the word chazak, be strong, are spelled out in the first letters of each verse. So if you have a source sheet in front of you, on page two, you'll see a, a copy of El Nora Alila. The first paragraph is uh, the introduction, um, sort of a chorus of sorts. And then if you look on the right-hand side of the page in the Hebrew, the letters at the beginning of each stanza spell out Moshe, Chazak. And the last uh, stanza is an addition that appears in some versions of El Nora Alila. So this poem is a plea for forgiveness. This piyut entered the Ashkenazic Machsor in the 20th century, marking the opening of the Ark for Ne'ilah. The last stanza, as I just mentioned, is not part of the original poem, but has been attached to it in many editions, including the edition in Lev Shalem. So let's go to page two of our source sheet and take a look at the piyut, at the poem. I want to draw our attention here to um, the first uh, the first, the third, and the fourth stanzas. So the first stanza it begins, El Nora Alila, awe-inspiring creator God. And again, El Nora Alila, awe-inspiring creator God. Find forgiveness for us in this closing hour. Bishat Hanaila. Let's go to the third stanza. As we pour out our souls, Wipe away our sins and denials. Craft forgiveness for us. In this closing hour. Be our protector. Shield us from terror. Seal our fate for joy and glory. In this closing hour. And if you scan down either in the, in the Hebrew or in the transliteration, or you can see as it's translated in the English, each stanza ends with these words. In this final closing hour. So this piyut is drawing our attention to what's happening in the moment. It's saying, this is it. This is the final hour. This is the these are the final moments of Yom Kippur. It's heightening 
in, in saying over and over again, Bisha'atani ila, it's the closing hour, it's the closing hour, it's the closing hour. It's heightening our sense of urgency, pushing us further into a raw emotional place. And this intensity builds throughout the service. So let's look at source number three. We're still on page two. Paradoxically, as the initial hunger from fasting for those who have fasted wears off, many worshipers feel a revitalization of their spiritual strength. I don't know if you've felt this before, but there's sort of an exhaustion that can set in in the afternoon of Yom Kippur. It's been a lot. If you're fasting, probably are really hungry. If you're not fasting, you're probably really tired, and you probably are really hungry. And there's sort of an exhaustion that the day is the day is still going on, there's still more to do. And then somehow, and I have experienced this almost every year, somehow in those final moments, there's this extra surge of energy. I'm a runner and I feel this when I'm running. That mile, you know, the middle of my run might be totally exhausting. And somehow that last mile of the run, there's this extra bit of energy that comes from, I don't know where, but that's sort of what's happening emotionally for us with the Ni'ila service. Beginning with the repetition of the Amidah, the Ark remains open throughout the Ni'ila service. And so all who are physically capable remain standing, an act that requires additional effort and adds to the feeling of urgency and spiritual transformation. And for those who aren't able to stand, the, in the invitation is to lift yourself spiritually. This is wear yourself down spiritually, be totally raw and open in this moment, give it your all, physically, emotionally. In the Amidah, this commentary tells us, the phrase used since Rosh Hashanah, inscribe us in the Book of Life, write us in the Book of Life, now becomes seal us in the Book of Life. So seal comes from the word lachtom, to sign, and you can see this in the fourth stanza of El Nora Alila. So let's go back up there. The the chatmim. It, here it means uh, seal our fate for joy and glory, Bisha in the closing hour. And you might remember the Seal us in the book of life. Don't just write us there. Don't just say that it's gonna be that way. Don't just let me. Let it not be that I am only considered for good and, 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 um, and written for life, but actually that it's a done deal that, I'm, that I will live this year. So this, this phrase, seal us in the book of life, is the final seal placed on the divine decree. And so as the climax of the Day of Atonement of Yom Kippur rapidly approaches, the prayer leader and the congregation join in the recitation of three biblical sentences whereby they rededicate themselves to the essential theological doctrines of Judaism. So this is at the very end of the service. In many communities, this is a moment when maybe all the kids are already on the bima with, you know, with their shofarot. Um, people are standing, the, the energy is, it's totally the climax of the service because we're almost there. So the first is a single recitation of the Shema this quintessential affirmation of faith. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. This is followed by a threefold repetition of praised is God's name, whose glorious kingdom forever and ever. The line that's usually recited as a silent response to the Shema. Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Leolam Va'ed. And finally, the verse Adonai Hu HaElohim, the Lord is God is repeated seven times. Rabbis tend to keep track, if you can't see our hands on the um, lectern, we tend to keep track of which number we're at. We're totally exhausted at that point. So this declaration is followed by a long blast of the shofar, an echo of the ancient practice of sounding the shofar to proclaim the beginning of the 50th, the jubilee, year of freedom throughout the land. And that comes from Leviticus 25, 9. Just as all lands returned to their original owners and people who were enslaved were freed from their masters with the onset of the Jubilee year, so we celebrate our personal liberation from the overwhelming burden of our transgressions. Such a release in that moment. We've been blowing the shofar throughout the month of Elul, and we heard it on Rosh Hashanah, and in many ways that 
shofar, that blast of the shofar is cracking our hearts open. And in some ways, this one is meant to seal it back up. The piercing blast of the ram's horn also symbolizes the certainty that we have been granted divine forgiveness and been inscribed for a good year. This confidence in the future is expressed as all join in in saying, L'shana haba'a b'yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. So let's take some time to talk a little bit more about the tone and urgency of Ne'ila. We'll start, we're on page three of the source sheet, and we'll look at source number four. The sun is in the treetops. It's Ne'ila, and we're watching as the gates of heaven slowly begin to close, holding a mixture of hope and trepidation. Have we changed enough this year, this day, for our prayers to break through into the heavens? Will the gates close before we can plead our case? So I don't know, I've felt this before, I don't know if you have, but I have definitely had this feeling of getting to the end and feeling like, no, 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 wait, there's more to do. There's more work, I'm not done, I'm not ready. And that is part of the emotional, uh, that is part of the, the tone and the emotional uh, sensation of the moment. But wait, what gates? You probably have been thinking this many years before, many times before, maybe during this text study as well. What are we talking about? What gates? What, what does that mean? So let's look at source number five. Rabbi Artsin brings us into these questions. Where are those gates? Inside our hearts? In God's ample love? At heaven's door? The choreography of keeping the ark open throughout the Ne'ilah service offers a visual that the closing gates are literally just before our eyes, the gates of Torah. But that where is never nailed down, never specified. And we don't identify the when of our gates either, the end of services, the end of Yom Kippur. So this too can feel almost anxiety producing and nerve wracking. Ah, I want to get through this. But there's an interesting idea. This is an interesting idea, maybe in contrast to other Jewish perspectives on shuva, on repentance, this idea of urgency. Rabbi Artsin reminds us and brings us into this idea that the bigger paradox, even than these gates themselves, is the very tradition that is rushing us to repent while there's still time. That tradition that's rushing us to repair while there's still time is also unambiguous in holding that God always welcomes the sinner, is also always eager for us to turn in repentance. But if God is always eager to turn, to receive the, the sinner in repentance, then what's the rush? Why do we feel pushed to hasten our process to coincide with the conclusion of Yom Kippur? Why do we need to rush so much if we're always able to do this if we are encouraged as we are to throughout the year atone for our sins, repent, make apologies, make amends, and change, what's the big rush right now? So Rabbi Artsin suggests, were we to operate only with the assumption that repentance always is available, then we would never be motivated to actually change at a particular instance. Just, just as knowledge of our certain mortality infuses our life with a need to seize the day, so does the push of Yom Kippur as a time particularly favorable to tshuva, repentance, inspire us to more focused contemplation than a more open-ended process would. And as I said in my text study uh, for um, Rosh Hashanah, on Yaser Aser Yimei Tshuva, this is a season when we are told that there, that there is extra openness to, to repentance, to tshuva, that God is extra present for us in that time. And so there's an encouragement to, to do this always, but also to acknowledge that this season, there's a particularism to this season, a particular openness and a particular opportunity. If all we had was a sense that we must repent today before the end of the day, then repentance is paralyzed by the ticking of the clock, by the desperation inspired by time running out. It is precisely the paradoxical balance of an open-ended process joining hands with a particularly favorable moment that makes forward movement happen. I'll read that again. This is from Rabbi Artson. 
It is precisely the paradoxical balance of an open-ended process, joining hands with a particularly favorable moment that makes forward movement happen. So I wanna encourage you to notice for yourself what you're feeling and experiencing in that final service. How are those sensations? I'll be able to do this later, it's okay. I've been able to do this and I gotta get this in right now. Things are, it's about, to be, it's about to be over. This moment is going to end. How do those paradoxical sensations serve you and guide your experience? So what happens after Ni'ila? We're on page four of the source sheet looking at source number six. One of my favorite stories, a Hasidic tale, the story of Reb Zusia. So this Rebbe was a much beloved uh, teacher and scholar, loved by his students. And there's a story that's told of a, of a conversation that he had with his students in his final hour. He began to weep until one of the students asked, Rabbi, why do you weep? Surely if anyone has assured a place in the kingdom of heaven, it is you. The rabbi turned his head toward his beloved students and began to speak softly. If my children, when I stand before the heavenly court, I am asked, Zeusia, why were you not a Moses? I shall have no hesitation affirming, I was not born a Moses. If they ask me, why were you not an Elijah? I shall speak with confidence, neither am I an Elijah. I weep, friends, because there's only one question I fear to be asked. Why were you not Zeusia? So the close of Yom Kippur is the start also of a new chapter in our year and in our lives when we might become some new, fuller version of ourselves. And the story of Reb Zusia reminds us that what happens after Ne'ilah is a new chapter of becoming for us, a new opportunity for us to become who we are, for Reb Zusia to become Reb Zusia, for me to become me, for you to become more you. So looking at source number seven, the journey through Yom Kippur was a real journey, one to be measured not by what we feel when it is over, but by how we lead our lives in the days and weeks and years afterwards. When the final shofar blast has pierced not only the highest reach of the heavens, but also the deepest reach of our souls. What's standing in my way of becoming me? What's standing in your way of becoming you? What possibilities await us on the other side of the gates? There's so much uncertainty there, and it can be intimidating for sure, but also hopeful and opening. So our final source, source number eight, Rebecca Solnit, she says, hope locates itself in the premises that we don't know what will happen and that in the spaciousness of uncertainty is room to act. In the spaciousness of, in, of uncertainty is the room to act. When you recognize uncertainty, you recognize that you may be able to influence the outcomes, you alone or you in concert with a few dozen or several million others. Hope is an embrace of the unknown and knowable. It is a belief that what we do matters. Hope is an embrace of the unknown and the knowable. It is the belief that what we do matters. This idea is central in Yom Kippur and central in this final service of Yom Kippur. If what we did did not matter, we would have nothing to be atoning for. We would not be worried. But what we do matters. We believe that deeply as Jews. And this day Yom Kippur is about what we do and how we are in the world. So take a moment to think for yourself, where is it that I want to be at the end of this day? What is standing in my way? What possibilities await me on the other side of those gates? As we near the end of Yom Kippur, let us feel the intensity of the season and of the day. 
May we stand in awe as the gates close, humbled by the unknown and hopeful for the year ahead. May we be open to transformation. Gamar Khatima Tova, may our ceiling be for good. <laughs>